Feels good. Feels good to be wired. Um, so I am David Walker. Um, I, I, I'm not the founder of the museum because we actually we were founded during the Great Depression in 1931. So, but what you see is um, some of the fruits of, uh, of, of, of the work that we've been doing the last couple of years. I want to thank uh, museum trustee Heather Goldman, who's here somewhere. Where are you, Heather? Raise your hand. There you are over there. Yeah, Heather and, and her good buddy, uh, Robert Goldberg, who's here. Thank you guys so much for having the vision to do this, uh, this, this great event here at the Nevada Museum of Art. Um, I'm thrilled um, that you're here tonight, and uh, I'd like to share a short presentation with you. When I say short, it's going to be about 15 minutes. Uh, it's, it's sort of a Nevada 101 presentation, and I think you'll see that looking into our past uh, will help inspire some of the conversations that you're going to be having uh, over the next day and a half. So um, that's what this is all about. And let me see if I can work this thing. Am I up? Good, good. Okay. Well, the world often sees Nevada as an empty, desolate, rural, or marginal uh, sp a place. Uh, this is a, a photograph by Timothy O'Sullivan. Uh, his images seared Nevada's image as an exotic, mysterious, and otherworldly place uh, into 19th century America and Europe collective consciousness. And for many, this still exists today. We see Nevada, its geography, cultures, and industries as a place that informs everything that we do at this museum. We honor the history at this place every day because the story of Nevada resonates globally, perhaps more than ever today, uh, which is why you are here gathering uh, with us uh, our building, designed by architect Will Bruder, reflects our dramatic geography and took its cues from the Black Rock Range a few hours north of Reno. As you will soon understand, we are not your typical art museum. In fact, our mission statement reads, we are a museum of ideas. People gravitate to extreme environments like Nevada to experiment, test, and take risks. There are fewer rules here, and it's easier to realize the unthinkable. Between 1951 and 1992, just 65 miles northwest of Las Vegas, the U.S. Department of Energy tested 928 nuclear devices, which included nearly 100 above-ground tests and over 800 underground tests resulting in craters such as this that still exist out in our landscape. It ain't pretty, is it? Um, most of these images in this presentation that I'm sharing with you tonight are from the museum's signature altered landscape collection. It's more than 2,000 photographs that really document how man has altered the landscape uh, that we live in, mostly in the United States. So I just wanted to put that out there. Many don't realize that 85% of Nevada is managed by the federal government. It's Bureau of Land Management land. Uh, this is tricky. But it's also good. Uh, access to federally managed public lands means that large-scale mining operations owned primarily by multinational corporations dot the entire landscape. These companies extract a range of minerals and metals from copper to gypsum to gold to silver, and then export them around the world. This image depicts Virginia City in the mid-1980s, Comstock silver mining. It shows not only the mining operations, but also instant cities that sprung up overnight during this time. Nevada's frontier cycles of boom to bust are profound cautionary tales. This aerial image by David Mizell, who is also an artist in our Alter Landscape collection, depicts the American mine, uh, the, the Carlin Gold Mine in Nevada, an open pit gold mine just four hours north of Nevada near Elko. And there are two more images of that extraordinary mine. Lithium. Nevada is also home to the only operating lithium mine in the United States, and this is about three hours uh, from Reno. 
This is a photograph staged by New York-based artist David Benjamin, who the museum commissioned in 2011 as part of an exhibition called Landscape Futures. Benjamin undertook a project called The Gray Rush that drew a parallel between California's iconic gold rush of the 19th century and what lithium mining could mean to Nevada in the future. In Nevada, water is scarce. We live in a desert. Large-scale water reclamation projects to divert water resources away from their natural flows to areas of population growth and settlement were required. The story of water in southern Nevada is similar, where the Colorado River, diverted by the construction of the Boulder Dam, at the time it was completed in 1936, it held the record as the tallest dam in the world. Today known as the Hoover Dam, it provides nearly 18 million people in Arizona, California, and Nevada and water. And what, will we, what do we do with that in uh, uh, Las Vegas? <laughs> this is also another photograph from the Alter Landscape Collection, Canadian artist Edward Bertinsky from his water series. Closer to home, uh, about an hour north of here, is what used to be the, Winneb the Winnemucca Lake. Uh, and this is uh, just uh, right off the, uh, the, the, the Paiute uh, Indian uh, tribe of land, uh, native land. Uh, this was a real lake. Uh, water was, was uh, uh, diverted from this lake. The BLM took it over. And uh, this is what it looks like today. It's a playa. It's a dry lake bed. And in 2011, we commissioned Chris Drury, uh, 2009 actually, a British artist, a very famous uh, land artist to come, uh, who took great interest in this uh, story. And he created a 300-foot diameter drawing uh, of a Native American weaving design. And this has come to represent or, symbolic or be symbolic for uh, the, w the land that was taken away from our Native peoples and um, uh, uh, taken over by the federal government. Uh, very important piece, and we're very proud to have produced this piece. Daniel McCormick, Mary O'Brien, create these 360-foot-long uh, reed water sculptures, uh, also the Truckee River and also the Carson River, uh, the Army Corps uh, uh, of Engineers came in and diverted uh, waters to places where it should not have gone, created a lot of problems. These artists came in, we commissioned them in partnership with the Nature Cons Conservancy and created these wonderful sculptures that are now allowing the river to uh, uh, go back and, and, and become part of its, of, of its original natural flow. These will actually disappear uh, over time. So we call this art that walks in the world. A lot of what we do at this museum uh, is, is activist art, and this is a part of that. 5% of Nevada is under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Department of Defense. Uh, what you're looking at here is the Wendover Army Air Base, active from 1942 to 1969, conceived as a heavy bombardment training base during World War II. You're looking at the hangar that once housed the Enola Gay, the aircraft that dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima in 1945. In 1952, the military began testing high explosive bombs on an enormous expanse of public land near Fallon, Nevada, which is only about an hour away from us. When the international art world considers Nevada, it is because we are the birthplace of land art. Some of the 20th century's most celebrated artists have created work here. In 1962, Swiss artist Gene Tingley staged his own explosive large-scale performance study for an end of the world, and this was just 10 miles south of Las Vegas on the Gene Dry Lake. It was also a call to humanity to consider the broader implications of, an on, uh, of its ongoing nuclear pursuits. Michael Heiser, uh, who lives in New York now, but is a Nevadan, and his father was an archaeologist here uh, in Nevada, created one of the first large-scale drawings on the Gene Dry Lake, uh, uh, just, just south of Las Vegas, Nevada. He did this with motorcycles, by the way. Double negative, the Mormon Mesa, just north of Las Vegas. Uh, two large 
uh, trenches that were carved out uh, of the mesa, uh, di- displacing 250,000 tons of earthen rock. Very famous piece. And this is Michael Heiser's most recent piece. This is the crew de da- The crew? The crew de da- Is that the word? Crew de da- Something like that. I'm, I've had two glasses of wine. Sorry. I shouldn't have done that, especially in the, with this audience. Crew de da- This is a mile and a half long, and it's a quarter mile wide. And this is a sculpture. It's the largest sculpture on the planet. And he's been working on this for 40 years. And uh, recently we worked with Senator Harry Reid and others in Washington uh, to make 800,000 acres around this project, the Basin and Range National Park, uh, guaranteeing, hopefully guaranteeing, that we won't see mining and, 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 and urban development uh, around this amazing project. Uh, you don't get to see it now, but you might get to see it in 10 years. In 2012, the Swiss artist Ugo Rondinoni came to see us. He had a vision for a project he wanted to do in Nevada. He didn't know exactly where. And of course, he picked a BLM site. <laughs> That's okay. We worked through that. We have a very good law firm, by the way, McDonald Carano next door. <laughs> And they do everything in kind for us, so we're very lucky. Uh, but this is the artist. Uh, he's a troublemaker. Uh, but he created a piece called Seven Magic Mountains, and we produced it. Uh, it was a $3.5 million project, opened in 2016. Uh, it's about 10 miles south of Las Vegas, right next to the Gene Dry Lake, where some of these other famous historical land art projects uh, were realized back in the 60s. Uh, each one of these totems is about 35 feet tall, and each boulder is 40 to 60 tons each. Uh, it was designed to be a two-year project. You can see some of the work. We got Las Vegas Paving Corporation, did all the work for us. It was fantastic. We see about 1,000 people a day who come from all over the world to see this project. It's been so popular. So we are now working with the BLM, Clark County, our donors, uh, and it looks like we're going to extend this project for another 20 years, perhaps another 100 years. So we're very proud of it. It's a very, very popular project. Can you say the 10? Hmm? 10 miles out of Vegas? Mm hmm. Maybe 15. I lied. <laughs> 10 or 15, you know. Yeah, Just don't be in a rush. Just don't be in a rush. Okay, so this is the museum, right? Um, we were founded during the Great Depression, 1931. Um, we're the only accredited art museum in the state of Nevada. And I think you already get the sense that our priority is to serve the northern Nevada region. Reno, of course, Tahoe. But we work around, but we work around the state. Um, it's a great museum. It was, um, ex- as you know, it was inspired uh, by, by the great, uh, the, the rock formation in, in, uh, north of here. Uh, what we have here that is very unique is we have a research center. It's called the Center for Art and Environment. And we look at how artists creatively interact with natural built and virtual environments here. We have archive materials from more than a thousand artists from all seven continents uh, that, that deal with this. Uh, we have people who come from all over the world, students, scholars, writers, to come and study uh, the archives here at this museum. Michael Heiser, Walter D. Maria, Center for Land Use and Interpretation. The list goes on and on. This is Lita Albuquerque. This is a major project she did in Antarctica called Stellar Access. Uh, we have this archive, an extreme environment. We occasionally do exhibitions. Uh, these are the kinds of materials people come and see and write about and study when they're writing books uh, about whatever it is they're writing books about. So this museum attracts a lot of international traffic because of the research center here at the museum. Okay, now this is a guy named Dr. James Church. He was a University of Nevada Reno professor. He was a scientist, a humanist, and a lover of the arts. Uh, And he established the first snow station on the top of Mount Rose. And if you could see earlier, the tallest peak out here you could see from our museum is Mount Rose. Uh, And that's where this uh, first uh, snow station was was, uh, established. Um, it was established to measure the water, water content in snow. 
uh, and then he began tracking fluctuating levels over time, which helped to establish the field of climate science, which gave rise to the study of climate change. Dr. James Church also happened to be the founder of this museum. So from our very beginning, the concept of art and environment has been central to our mission. What a cool founder, huh? Now this is a photograph that he took from Mount Rose uh, of Lake Tahoe. Uh, we love this photograph. And in 2014, we commissioned the great architect and artist Maya Lin. Uh, she is the same person who designed the v Vietnam Veterans Memorial uh, Wall in Washington, D.C., and is a good friend of this museum. Uh, and this piece called My, uh, Cloud Line Mount Rose at 8,500 square feet uh, is a memorial to James Church and the founding of climate science. So um, we're very, very pleased to have this here. For those of you who are new to the area, Lake Tahoe is right over the hills. It's a 45-minute drive. It's the largest alpine lake in North America. It's beautiful, isn't it? Not all of us can afford to have a home on the shore of Lake Tahoe, but we aspire to that. <laughs> the outflow of Lake Tahoe is the Truckee River, and it's a 121-mile river. It's the most litiga litigated uh, body of water uh, in the United States. It comes right through downtown Reno. We get a lot of our water uh, from this great river. And it ends in the desert north of here. It actually runs north. It's quite interesting. And it ends in the desert. Uh, it ends on the Paiute Indian Reservation and at a place called Pi uh, uh, Pyramid Lake. Isn't that beautiful? And that lake is almost as big as Lake Tahoe. So that's where all that water goes. It also happens to be very near Black Rock City, which is where the great Burning Man event happens every year. There's 70,000 people who have come from all over the world to celebrate and make art and collaborate uh, just, just right near Reno. You, anybody been to Burning Man? A few of you? Okay, well, by the end of this evening, I think I'm going to convince most of you, you better go. Uh, Elon Musk goes. The Google guys go. A lot of other guys go. Um, I go sometimes. I'm on the board, so I have to go. But uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, recently, Burning Man became a nonprofit. It was a, an LLC for many years, uh, and it became a nonprofit. And one of the first uh, things that happened was we acquired the great 4,000-acre uh, fly ranch. And this, these are beautiful 104-degree waters that spurt out of this formation. And uh, this is going to be the future year-round home for Burning Man. It's going to have a philosophic center, a lot of other things. It's not going to replace the event that happens every year. We want to keep it clean and pristine and beautiful. We have um, the Center for Art and Environment. We have a major archive collection in uh, just a few months ago, for the first time ever, drawing on our special archive collection, we presented the remarkable story of how the legendary Nevada gathering evolved from humble countercultural roots in San Francisco's uh, Baker Beach into the world-famous desert convergence it is today. So never before seen photographs, artifacts, journals, sketches, and notebooks revealed how the temporary experimental desert city came to be and how it continues to evolve. We are happy that this exhibition just left the museum and is on its way to Washington, D.C., where it will be part of a large Burning Man exhibition at the Renwick Gallery uh, later this month. Okay, this is where it gets good. Pay attention. <laughs> Big ideas unfold in the desert. So it came as no surprise when artist and geographer Trevor Paglin, a MacArthur Foundation fellow, approached the museum in 2015 to imagine the, uh, the unimaginable, to send a satellite sculpture into orbit. Along with Paglin, we are preparing to embark upon an exploration of the most extreme environment of them all, outer space. For more than half of his career, Paglin has been documenting classified military and security bases in the deserts of the American West, 
mostly in Nevada. These sites are so remote that Paglen employs high-powered telescopes to photograph these clandestine facilities. In fact, the title of his upcoming retrospective at the Smithsonian's American Art Museum this summer is titled Sites Unseen, which is a great title. Um, we are going to launch a project called Orbital Reflector. And if you saw that giant Mylar prototype in the atrium on your way up, now you know what that is. It's a very small version of what's going to go up on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket in July or early August of this summer. Uh, it's, a, it's a major, major event. Um, it's not going up for military reasons. It's not going up for commercial reasons. It's purely an artistic gesture. And as Trevor likes to say, when we look up into the starry night sky, we tend to see reflections of ourselves. And that's what this project's about. It's going to go up on a rocket, shoot out. There's a CubeSat. That's a CubeSat, right? About the size of a brick, really. And then this big old thing opens up. A little CO2 cartridge fills it up. It's real big. It's a long, 100-foot-long diamond shape. And this bad boy is going to be seen during the evening, the naked eye. You're going to be able to look up and see it as it's zipping around the planet. Uh, we're going to develop STEAM education curriculum, lesson plans. We're going to engage the entire United States in a new educational agenda around STEAM. And I can't think of a better icon to STEAM education. For those of you who don't know what that is, We've been talking a lot about STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. We think that's great, but we think you add art, the A, to that, suddenly it becomes interdisciplinary and becomes real. And we're not just about creating jobs anymore. We're about creating thought leaders and, and, and sort of a new paradigm. And that's what this project's about. So we're very proud uh, of this project. I could tell you, we, most museums, art museums, hire art historians to run their education department, not at this museum. We hired a scientist. We have a renowned um, science educator here, Marissa Cooper, and uh, that has allowed us to get very serious about art and science. So this is our icon. Last week in this very space, we held a conference, the Nevada STEAM Conference. 200 educators, K-12 educators came from all over the state of Nevada and actually from outside of Nevada to explore best practices of STEAM education. Uh, we are supported by the, uh, the Nevada Department of Education and also the Governor's STEM uh, Advisory Council. Uh, the idea is to inspire student creativity and foster innovation in our public schools. I'm almost done. Are we done? Okay. This is kind of cute. Sorry, I got to... Trevor likes government patches, so he creates his own. Uh, and that's the patch that will go along with our, our project here. Um, okay, so when, when you, when you uh, take risks and you do things like this, um, you get a lot of attention. And that's what's been happening the last couple of years. Just the last 18 months, uh, these are some of the, um, uh, some of the accoloids and, and, and media that we have uh, seen here at the Nevada Museum of Art. Uh, now, we're very happy that you're all here today, and I think most of you know a lot about our proximity to the Silicon Valley, to the Bay Area, and of course, you probably know a lot about uh, TRIC, the, the uh, uh, Tahoe Reno Industrial Center, uh, home to uh, Switch, Tesla, Blockchain, Google, across the road, Apple, and the list goes on and on. This is a very exciting moment for Nevada. This is a very exciting industry. Uh, and, and move forward for us. Uh, this is the uh, Tesla Gigafactory, almost done. And I think you find it interesting when you contrast it to the Michael Heiser project, right? Similar scale. Switch. Switch are, are the um, great company. Uh, Christy Overgaard's on the board. She's here tonight. Where's Christy? Say hi, Christy, wherever you are. Uh, Christy is also... Um, and Switch are the big underwriters, the big sponsors of our STEAM education programs here at the Nevada Museum of Art. Now, we're working with the Pritzker Prize-winning architect, Rome Coolhouse. We're currently in design feasibility and concept studies right now, and we're exploring possibilities 
uh, for expanding the museum outside this neighborhood. Uh, there we are looking at Trick. And those are our concepts for what we're looking at right now. And I want to thank you very much for hearing this presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much. David, great presentation. Fascinating. So, uh, yep, okay, great. Um, so we have uh, two mayors coming to have a conversation uh, by themselves about this topic, art, uh, and anything else that's on their mind relationship in, in, in relation to tech and art creativity. Uh, so we have the mayor of, uh, of Reno, who is an entrepreneur in her own right. Uh, and you've probably heard the headlines. And if those, of, th those of you who are not from Reno, it's you know, about 14% unemployment rate down to 4 uh, And the community's really come together to, to bring in all kinds.